member for Nahan. Start by congratulating you and all members of this House for their election to this House and to say that it is particularly an honour to be here and that we I look forward to many good debates and good work. Madam Acting Speaker, fellow members, my name is Mike Nahan. I come to this House from the, as the member for Riverton. The electorate of Riverton is framed by the Canning River in the north, Canningville Industrial Centre in the south, the safe Liberal seat in the west, and the safe Labour seat in the east of Cannington. Riverton is a quintessential West Australian community, suburban, middle class, aspirational, family oriented, and politically pragmatic. The area was first subdivided 40 years ago to accommodate people drawn to the state during the first iron ore boom. It has grown in spurts with each successive boom, including this one. From the start, the area attracted a large number of overseas migrants, first British, then people of Chinese descent from Southeast Asia, Tamils from Sri Lanka, and in recent time, people from India and China. As a result, it has a very large number of overseas migrants and has the highest proportion of residents with Asian ancestry across our electorates. Now, as in the past, people would have been drawn to this area primarily because it's ethnic diversity and tolerance, safe suburban lifestyles, spacious and affordable housing, good transport links, and importantly, excellent public schools. These attributes define and unite the area. There was a strong and I believe accurate view in the electorate that many of these attributes were being allowed to wane. That is why I'm here. And that is why there was a change of government. It is my task to ensure that these attributes in Riverton are preserved and enhanced, a task I take on with pleasure and honor. Two concerns stand out in the priorities of Riverton, empowering public schools and completing Roe Highway. The electorate has in Ross Moyne and Williton High Schools the state's top two public schools. They excel academically and in terms of the quality of education. The excellence of these schools is the key reason why people live in the area and come to the area and stay in the area. The schools draw in those who place a high premium on academic achievement and good public education. While other electorates have seen a massive exodus of students from the public education system, this has not happened in Riverton. Indeed, only 10% of the children from Riverton attend private secondary schools, less than a third of the rate of comparable areas. The high quality of public secondary schools and a supportive community have contributed significantly to the quality of the electorate's primary public schools. Nonetheless, the performance of Riverton schools is being restrained by a lack of funding and excessive bureaucracy. I look forward to working with the government to address both constraints and enable public education Riverton to excel further. We must complete Roe Highway, the need for an efficient ring road through the southern metropolitan area to the port of Fremantle has been known for over 40 years. The route was identified and the land zoned for the route over, zoned for the route over 30 years ago. Seven stages of the ring road, Roe Highway, have been built with the help of the Commonwealth. But it stops abruptly at the highway, the freeway, clogging the freeway, pushing thousands of heavily laden trucks onto suburban roads each day, endangering lives and health, imposing high costs on shippers and consumers, and destroying suburban roads. It was, it is, a planning bungle of the worst order. It is set to get worse, even if, even if substantial share of the port traffic is transshipped to train, truck traffic from the port is set to double over the next seven years and will remain high thereafter. We must now complete the task with Roe Highway Stage 8. This can be achieved while protecting the environment along the route, and I look forward to working with the government to achieve this vital piece of economic infrastructure. My journey to this house is perhaps different than most of yours. 
I am, as they say, from the ideas business. In the last 30 years, I have enjoyed challenging work in academia, public service, think tanks in Australia and overseas, in consultancies and the media as an economist, policy analyst and commentator. I was never inspired, aspired to be a politician, even though my work has often brought me into the political sphere. But times have changed, and my commitment to Western Australia convinced me to throw my hat in the rink. The transition to politics will be interesting, but it will not be a case of abandoning ideas for politics, for I am determined that the two shall not be mutually exclusive. It is my intention to use my experience and skills to help ensure that we in the Liberal Party keep true to our values, combine good policy and good government and good politics, and principle of pragmatism. I am a liberal, a classical liberal, not from birth or social affiliation, but from the observation of what makes for a good society, from the belief in the, rational, the rationality of free men and women and from the belief that accumulated power tends to be abused. I believe in the natural right of individuals, that people should be free to choose to work, pray, play, and shop. That people should be allowed to own and enjoy property willingly and of own volition, as well as the fruits of their own labor. Respect for these rights, I believe, are the foundations of a good society and good government. I also believe that with freedom comes responsibility. That is, the right to choose comes, must come with the responsibility for the consequences of one's choices. Rights and responsibilities are two sides of the same coin. Too often, and with tragic consequences, rights have been allowed to be divorced from responsibility. Of course, there are limits to individual freedom. Freedom is not absolute, and in its nature must respect other people's freedom. Within limits, within humane limits of a humane society, we must take responsibility for ourselves and for our community. I believe that open and competitive markets, although imperfect and at times, like now, volatile and harsh, are the best means of allocating resources, creating jobs and wealth, ensuring freedom and prosperity, and preserving the environment. The growth in wealth and prosperity around the world over the last 20 years, has, which has produced the largest movement of people from poverty in human history, is testament to the benefits of economic freedom. Australia has just gone through the most protracted period of sustained economic growth in its history, led by Western Australia, thanks primar primarily to the market-based reforms introduced by state and commonwealth governments during the 1980s and 90s. The recent collapse of world markets has understandably cast doubt about markets and economic freedom. However, it would be a serious error for us, or governments generally, to reject open markets for greater government control and ownership. The current malaise was brought in part, in part by regulatory failure, both in government and elsewhere. I am a mig migrant from America, married to a migrant from Malaysia. I come to West Australia out of choice and knowing what the rest of the world has to offer. I have spent my life wandering the world and Australia, physically and mentally, trying to understand what makes for successful government, how different governments solve problems, what works and what does not work. The issues and challenges facing this House are not unique. The world is a vast laboratory which we must explore and learn from if we are to reach our potential. The West Australian economy thrives and wanes on the strengths of its global links. Indeed, Western Australia is one of the most globalized economies in the world. We must be global in our focus and cognizant that the world is an intensely competitive place which, re which rewards success greatly and treats failure ruthlessly. Western Australia is blessed with a large resource wealth, but so are many other places. Indeed, our advantage springs more from openness to markets, rule of law, and entrepreneurship than from our resource base. I am a skeptic of large government. 
while government play an essential, indeed pivotal, role in creating and sustaining a good society, they have an inherent tendency to, in, to interfere when they should not, to do what they should not, to act when they should not, to tax too much, regulate too much and poorly, and have an innate incapacity to comprehend the consequences of their own action. Markets do fail, and they are failing badly around the world now. Governments also fail, and their failures are often more pro pronounced and devastating than that of markets. The tendency for governments to do too much and to interfere too much not only harms people, businesses, and families, but it distracts them from their real priorities. Large government, too often, is essentially a smokescreen for inaction on difficult priorities. I know from my very brief period as a local member that the demands for more laws, regulations, and money from the public is unrelenting, and saying no, as Sir Humphrey would say, is electorally courageous. But at times, we must say no. We must say, we must say no so we can say yes where it really counts. I am an optimist. To me, the future, particularly in Western Australia, is filled with boundless opportunity, limited only by our imagination, desire, and willingness to work hard and smartly. I am a baby boomer, the luckiest of generation, which has experienced opportunity, wealth, and peace only dreamt of, of, previous, only dreamt of by previous generations. I was born of parents of the best generation, the generation that was young during the Great Depression and came of age in World War II. They knew the pain of tough economic times and the horror of war. They also knew firsthand that adversity could be overcome and prosperity and peace achieved through hard work. My parents instilled this belief in me. Like you, I have witnessed firsthand nations and states which with seemingly insurmountable problems transform themselves. And I have watched as in amazement as China rises out of poverty, war, and dysfunctional despotism. I have watched Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan transform themselves from poor, war-torn colonies to first world economic dynamos. I have watched Victoria rescue itself from a rust belt, rest, rust belt state. People, governments, societies are capable of incredible things if allowed and of mind too. Western Australia has used potential. It has the resources, the people, firms, links to world markets, a good reputation, good but stretched infrastructure, and a world-class quality of life. It has the potential to be one of the most prosperous and vibrant places on earth. We are heading into the most challenging economic time since my father's generation. The recession that is unfolding around the developed world will hit us in Western Australia. We will not be fully shielded by China. This will be a huge shock to the electorate. The last election was waged in a boom mentality, where the dominant theme was how to red redistribute the largesse created by the boom. The boom is now over. We are entering a period of rapidly declining growth in wealth, less here but here, State revenues falling and demands for assistance will rise. Fiscal stress will be a reality. We can, only, we can already see the change in budgetary positions in the eastern states. We will face difficult times. We, it will require tough choices and real leadership. It will require an emphasis on getting value for money and a focus on the priorities of health, education, public safety, and transport. However, the economy will recover. In the difficult times ahead, we must also continue to plan for the time when the funds flow again readily into the resources development. We must continue to focus on improving access to land and resources, building economic infrastructure, and developing Perth as a regional services and research center for the resources sector. During the boom, many were lulled into taking economic development for granted. It would be an even greater error during the difficult times ahead not to give economic development top priority. We can often forget it, but economic development and growth are the foundations of a vibrant, sustainable society. Growth 
creates wealth and opportunity. Wealth and opportunity creates the capacity and desire to protect and enhance the environment. The essential building block of society is the family. Society's definition of the family is becoming looser and more flexible. Governments are responding and interfering more in the definition, rights, responsibilities, and choices of families. There are, these are some of the most difficult, pressing issues awaiting us. It is my view that governments interfere too much, particularly in the provision of welfare to families. These actions are undermining the strengths of families and augmenting, if not creating, many of our most pressing issues. For many years, I have written and spoken in favor of federalism. Governments need limits. A vast country like Australia, with its great variety of people, industry, resources, needs variety in government. Multiple layers of government give rise to the need to allocate resources and responsibilities amongst governments. Australia's founding fathers recognized this and founded a federal constitution with defined roles and responsibilities between the states and the Commonwealth. I believe the original allocation fits this nation well even today. The Constitution, however, was flawed. It gave the Commonwealth access to an excessive share of taxing powers. As Alfred Deakin warned in 1902, the Constitution left the states legally free but financially bound to the chariot wills of the central government. Their need will be its opportunity. The states have become financially bound to the Commonwealth, as Deakin predicted. Contrary to Deakin's prediction, the states have also lost freedom and responsibilities. The impact on the, on the status and performances of the states have been profound and negative. It has allowed the Commonwealth to intrude. Mr. S Mr. Acting, M Madam Speaker, can I have a bit more time? Thanks. It has allowed the Commonwealth to intrude where it should not, to accumulate funds for itself, to redistribute funds according to its political interests rather than the needs of the economy and the wider community, and to leave the states depending on handouts and a dysfunctional set of taxes. This has undermined our system and the quality of government. The states have not been innocent victims. Too often they acquiesced, taking Joe Bielke Peterson missive that the only good tax is a Commonwealth tax. The states have often failed to innovate in the delivery of services, creating scope and demand for, the Commonwealth, for Commonwealth intervention. Too often, the states have lost without contest the battle of ideas. I hope to work with members on both sides of the House to reform and repair our federal system. It is up to this parliament, in my view. We in Australia, Western Australia, must take the lead. We have the most to lose. Western Australia's share of GST revenue is set to decline precipitously over the next few, month, few years, just when we need it most. Of course, we can't do it alone. It will be a very difficult issue. It's been tried before. But it's a task that we must pursue with vigor, innovation, and persistence. If we fail in this challenge, this parliament will become but an appendage of the Commonwealth, and our electorate will be the worst for it, as will the nation. The focus of reform, in my view, should include this parliament in the way it's formed. It might seem presumptive for a new member such as myself to so argue the case for change, but bear with me. I would like to see debate on mandatory voting. While I recognize that it is a firm feature of Australia's democracy, mandatory voting does, in my opinion, allow political parties to rely on compulsion rather than persuasion. It allows parties to take people for granted. Even more radically, I suppose, I think it is also time to have a debate about the structure of our parliament. Specifically, do we need a bicameral system anymore? Should the Legislative Council be retained? And if so, should it be converted into a house of review with part-time members appointed for their expertise rather than their political affiliation, such as the House of Lords? The Parliament, the Department of Parliament, and the Constitution Center do a great job in informing people of our system of government. I congratulate them. Debate about its renewal, I believe, will give people a greater sense of ownership of this system. I was raised in a dysfunctional hobby farm in the back blocks of Michigan. 
where I grew up, one of 13 children. Life was colorful, chaotic, as only large families can be. It gave me an affinity to people on the land, an aversion to hard physical labor, a love of nature, and also drove me to see the world. My Catholic upbringing instilled in me a belief in the sanctity of life, the innate goodness of people, and the need to help my fellow man, particularly those less fortunate than I. I admire many political leaders, but two local lads from the bush stand out as those I hope to emulate. John Hyde, the one-armed pundit from Del Wallinu, and Peter Walsh. Both men forcefully stuck to their principles in the party room and caucus. They provided leadership and ideas. They gave backbone to government. They shared a passion for good policy, and they were committed to their community. I thank the Liberal Party and the people of Riverton for their trust they have placed in me. I am well aware that the people of Riverton have put me on a short leash. There are many people who have worked to help me to get me here. I cannot thank them enough. I was amazed and humbled by the numbers of strangers in and out of the electorate and the Liberal Party who came to help me. I would like to thank them and I will promise to honor their, their efforts. There are a few people I'd like to mention. John Corser, who gave me advice and guidance. Mike Goddard, for his friendship and time. Harold Clough, in his own way, urged me to have a go. And Willie Packer, for his enthusiasm, amongst other things. I could not and would not have taken this journey without the love and support of my wife, Nyuk, who's up there somewhere and our children, Kiwi and Key. And true to form, Nyuk has deleted my words of appreciation for her. It's blank. Mr. Speaker, I can commit myself to representing the people of Riverton and to contribute to the well-being and growth of this great state, Western Australia. Thank you. The question is, the motion be agreed.